seventh year of public discussions on issues of food and health in conjunction with the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, Nutrition and Health Conference. Um, I'm delighted it's here in San Francisco, my hometown, um, since I'm usually flying around the world to keep up with this conference and moderate this public forum. I'm Tara LeMay, and I will be uh, curating this discussion for the evening. The format that we have is very convivial. Uh, basically, you're invited to enjoy the conversation with us as we talk to each other about the issues around food and health. Later on in the discussion, there is going to be some microphones around for some uh, questions that we'll have from the public. So let me introduce our speakers for tonight. Uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, many of you know who are attending the conference. Uh, Dr. Weil, or the father of integrative medicine, as he's widely known, is a strong advocate for an anti-inflammatory diet, believing that following this diet can help counteract the chronic inflammation that is more of a root cause of many serious diseases, including those that become more frequent as we age. Dr. Weil is the founder and director of the program, no, nope, the Center in Integrative Medicine at the College of Medicine at the University of Arizona, and as many of you know, is a best-selling author, having written over 10 books, Dr. Wall's interest, uh, latest book, Spontaneous Happiness, A Paradigm for Shifting Guide to Peak Emotional Wellness, will be released this November. And we'll talk a little bit about happiness and food. Uh, Robert Lustig um, is here. He spoke at the conference as well and be with us. He's the professor of clinical pediatrics at UCSF and is considered the leading expert on childhood obesity. Most recently, he's garnered a fair amount of attention for his research on the potential dangers of sugar consumption. His 2009 UC lecture titled Sugar, the Bitter Truth went viral on YouTube and has over a million hits to date. Actually, I checked just before I came, it's 1,264,000 plus some and counting, which is fairly impressive for a talk on biochemistry. I think maybe only the evolution of dance beats him on YouTube. Um, and Michael Pollan is with us, and he's the Knight Professor of Science and Environmental Journalism at UC Berkeley, and the author of New York Times bestsellers, The Omnivore's Dilemma in Defense of Food and Eater's Manifesto. In addition to uh, regularly contributing to the New York Times Magazine, his work has appeared in The Nation, Mother Jones, National Geographic, amongst others. And in 2010, he was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. He's also happy we're here in San Francisco this time. Um, <laughs> So with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Andy for a couple of opening comments, and then we're going to get into a dialogue. Thank you, Tara. Good evening. Uh, for the past two days, uh, we've had leading experts in nutrition and health uh, present their findings to an audience of health professionals. And uh, there is a very high degree of consensus among these people as to what we're doing wrong and what we should be doing. And very simply, it's that we should be eating more real food uh, and eating less processed, refined, and manufactured food, as Michael Pollan called as food, edible food-like substances. Uh, it seems very clear that this these change in the ways we eat which you saw also documented in the photographs that we just watched from Peter and Faith that are happening all over the world, that it is the increasing consumption of this refined process and manufactured food that's causing us all, all the trouble. And the advice is so simple to go back to eating real food, but the questions are how do we implement that? And uh, when I listened to many of the presenters today, and, and uh, certainly uh, when I heard uh, uh, Dr. Lustig's presentation yesterday on sugar, uh, the questions that always occur to me are, are what, what do we do with this information? You know, how, how do we take this information, which we all agree on, and translate it into action to improve eating habits in this culture? So I have dubbed this panel Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. So Michael is all about food and life, eating and living well and doing it in a great way. Um, Rob is about liberty or our free will of using sugar or heading down that sugary path and whether we choose to do it or not. And Andy is pursuing food and happiness questions. So for me, this was the way we all come together. Um, part of what we're going to talk a little bit about later is the farm bill and the question of whether or not our founding fathers really wanted us to pursue this form of life, liberty, and happiness, um, which we're not sure about. But the opening question for me is a really important one. The question is pivotal to this discussion. Is a calorie just a calorie? 
And I think that for those of you who are at the conference, it may still be the central point of the discussion. And for the public, it's a really important question. They tell us, uh, count your calories, use your calories, burn your calories, everything is about a calorie. So the question I open to you guys with is, is a calorie just a calorie? And I think, Rob, you're, uh, you're the, per the best one to start this off for us. Well, first of all, I want to say how um, excited, um, honored, and humbled I am to share this dais with uh, two heroes of nutrition and how daunted I am um, giving uh, any kind of public forum without slides. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to say. Um, to me, the question of a, is a calorie a calorie, I think, is the question. I think once you answer that question, you know which side of the argument you're on. Now, everyone assumes a calorie is a calorie, but you know, that's actually a relatively new phenomenon. That's only been since World War II. Prior to that, in medicine, we knew about diseases of obesity as being diseases of fat deposition due to hormonal disturbances. I'm an endocrinologist. I grew up with this. I grew up with that notion. Of course, we all believe if you eat more than you burn, you're going to store it. And so that the uh, phenomenon of energy storage is secondary to these two behaviors. Hang too on much in. Can you guys hear in the too back? Little out. Is, we're is all it, on handheld. Is this we need better? to be very yeah, careful sure, about sound here. Sorry. Too much in, too little out. Therefore, the result of the sum of two behaviors. And those behaviors are presumably within your control. But are they? That's the real question. Are those behaviors within your control? Is there such a thing as liberty to eat what you want? Well, certainly the lower socioeconomic strata doesn't get to eat what they want. They get to eat what's around, what's available, what they have access to. Basically, if you're poor, you don't have a choice. Okay? The thing that, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the kicker to this, the, the, the sine qua non, the thing, the slam dunk, is that we have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. And they don't diet and exercise. So for me, we have to move past this paradigm. So as an endocrinologist, the question is, OK, if we don't believe a calorie is a calorie, if we believe that it might actually be a, a defect of energy storage rather than a defect in behavior, where does that come from? Well, the hormone insulin. Insulin drives weight gain. It always has. It always will. Just ask any diabetic who has to go on insulin shots what happens to their weight. And that's not because they chose to eat differently. It's because insulin makes you hungry. And, they all, and all the diabetics know it. In fact, why do you think all of my teenage diabetics don't want to take their insulin because they're all trying to lose weight? So clearly, there's more to this story than just eat too much, exercise too little. The question is, is that cause or effect? And if it's effect, not cause, then the question is, what makes insulin go up? Well, there are certain foods that make insulin go up, and there are certain foods that don't. What's the food that makes insulin go up the most? Carbohydrate. What carbohydrate? Glucose? Sure. What about fructose? Fructose doesn't make insulin go up at all, except it does. Not initially, not in a glucose, uh, not in an insulin rise in response to a meal, but through the phenomenon of insulin resistance that occurs at the level of the liver, which I talked about yesterday for those of you who are here. So, so let's recap this for the general public. Sure. I just want to sort of swing back around and see if we're, we're getting this. So the, the story of a calorie that we hear in the media most of the time is you get some unit of food equals energy in, you're supposed to use that unit of food energy out. And what you're saying is there's a process in the middle that promotes more storage of that energy that might be different, and maybe that equation is not real. Maybe it's a storage problem. That's right. Is that? Absolutely. If we look at obesity as a defect in energy storage, it changes the entire equation, because now, instead of you eat too much, you exercise too little, now it's you store too much, and therefore, in order to have enough energy to burn, you have to eat more. And now the, def the defects in behavior are actually subservient to a biochemical process, which makes a whole lot more sense and does explain the obese six-month-old. Now, Andy, is that something, the notion of calories differently like that, how do you think about that? 
Well, I, I agree that a calorie is not a calorie and that you can feed the same me meals to people that have identical caloric content and get very different results depending on the composition of those meals. Um, and I, I think also uh, we have lab the culture still labor labors under the false assumption that dietary fat is what makes you fat. And clearly that is not the case. It is carbohydrate that is driving the obesity epidemic and its particular forms of carbohydrate. And the ways that we've changed carbohydrate foods in modern times, that's probably the most drastic change in, in food and eating habits. And this has happened over the past 50 or 60 years. A lot of that stuff that you saw in Peter and Faith slides you know, the packaged foods that are starting to appear in urban China, for example, and even in out-of-the-way places, it's mostly uh, the type of carbohydrate products of the modern food industry which are creating this storage problem that uh, Rob talked about. So, Rob, you're saying sugar is, the, is helping create the storage problem. Fructose is helping create the storage problem. Fructose is helping create a phenomenon called insulin resistance. Therefore, your pancreas has to make extra insulin to make the liver do its job. That raises insulin levels all over the body, and that drives energy into fat. That's what causes the storage problem. So it's downstream of what happens in the liver. And when you're talking about uh, sugar, you mean sugar, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, fruit, what are you talking about? Well, What's I, mean, the sort of I mean fructose in all its guises. So high fructose corn syrup, 55% fructose, Sucrose, 50% fructose. Maple syrup, essentially 50% fructose. Honey, 50% fructose. Agave nectar, everybody seems to be really onto that. 75% fructose, not so good. Okay. So Rob, this is, I think, this is important because uh, I, I think many people imagine that high, that high fructose corn syrup is, is more dangerous than table sugar, sucrose. And Michael and I have both campaigned against high fructose corn syrup, but it looks as if table sugar and many other sweeteners, it's all the same. Hey, half the world doesn't have high fructose corn syrup, actually more than half the world. The entire Pacific Rim doesn't have high fructose corn syrup, and they have an obesity and diabetes epidemic to beat the band. And one of the things I heard you say yesterday that is quite shocking, and I think that the general public has no sense of, is that drinking a glass of orange juice, fresh orange juice, might be not that different from drinking a glass of soda. But is it different than eating an orange? I, I think it's very different. <coughs> Explain why. So, that, so everybody says, well, so, is fruit bad? You know, this is the, uh, this is the thing that basically, you know, everybody's harping on. Is fruit bad? Number one, the amount of fructose in fruit is not that big. Did you ever see a kid eat more than one orange in a sitting? On the other hand, did you ever see a kid drink more than a glass of orange juice at a sitting? That glass of orange juice had four oranges, okay, and no fiber. If you look at the fructose to fiber ratio in standard fruits, it almost follows an exact correlation line. I mean, it's really tight. The only exception is grapes. Grapes have more fructose than fiber. Other than that, it's right along the line. And we know that fiber is the mitigating factor to carbohydrate absorption. It's actually the mitigating factor to fat absorption, too. It slows the absorption down, because this is a dose issue and it's also a flux issue. It's how much and also how fast your liver gets bombarded. And fiber is the key to slowing that process down. That keeps insulin down, that gives your liver a chance to metabolize it so you don't build up fatty liver, you don't get the insulin resistance. All the studies show that fiber consumption correlates with insulin sensitivity. So for me, fiber is the thing that makes fruit okay. But as soon as you juice it, and I don't care if it's you know, processed orange juice like Tropicana, or if it's Jamba juice, you know, from, you know, the, uh, you know, the local uh, place down the street here, it doesn't matter, the fiber's gone. So that, to me, is what makes fruit okay and juice not. So you're saying a calorie is not a calorie when sugar's involved? A absolutely. Actually, a calorie's not a calorie when any carbohydrate's involved. So what are other ways to think about that? I mean, can you expand on how you think about that from an other carbohydrates perspective? Well, for instance, lactose. So that's milk sugar. Lactose is galactose plus glucose. Glucose, as we know, can raise your blood sugar. 
Galactose gets converted in the liver to glucose. Basically, it's a wash unless you have a disease called galactosemia. But fructose is a whole different ballgame. Fructose is more like alcohol. We've published on the similarities between the two. And it makes sense that fructose is like alcohol because after all, where do you get your alcohol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called wine. We do it in Napa Valley every day. So the big difference between the two is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step in metabolism called glycolysis. And for fructose, we do our own glycolysis. After that, they're the same. They hit your mitochondria. There's no insulin regulation. There's no pop-off valve to liver starch or glycogen. And therefore, you're overloading your mitochondria. And that is the sine qua non of metabolic syndrome. You might call it mitochondrial constipation. <laughs> Too much in, not enough out. And that basically causes all of the reactive oxygen species that have been talked about you know, throughout this entire uh, 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 meeting. And that's driving cell aging, it's driving human aging, it's driving all the comorbidities and all the diseases we know about. So to me, that's the key. The key is let your mitochondria live. And in your talk, one of the things that was striking to me is that you talked about obesity, but also that it, it uh, affects heart disease and blood pressure, hypertension, things that are surprising. People don't normally think that sugar has anything to do with that. Salt is usually the culprit But there. it's even more than that because if you have a lot of insulin running around the body, uh, insulin has a lot of bad effects. Uh, insulin and related uh, regulatory substances promote cancer. So they accelerate tumor growth. So, and, and when I was doing research on aging, uh, I really became convinced that insulin is the key really to everything and to how we age and the diseases that we're susceptible to. Um, I talked yesterday about the idea of compression of morbidity as a goal of healthy aging. You're trying to squeeze the time of disability and decline at the end of life into as short a period as possible. Diabetes is the, the model of accelerated aging. That people with diabetes develop the diseases of aging decades earlier than people without diabetes. So it's a perfect model to study of accelerated aging, and that is all, they, that is all consequences of insulin. Insulin is the central player in all of this. So Andy, as you know, over the, the various public forums we've had, we've talked about uh, calorie not a calorie in things like fats. So saturated fats, non-saturated fats, how do we look at that? And, and it was, uh, it's an interesting way to express that for people. People change to olive oil, they move to avocado. That seems like a, yeah, we can sort of handle that movement in our diet. Yeah. But giving up all sugar seems to me like an impossible task for most of the world, not only the U.S. How are you guys thinking about this? Well, I want to, I you know, this is a question. I want to hear Michael on this because... I'm not giving up sugar. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a presumptuous question. We went to a faculty dinner last night, and Rob, I noticed that you and I both polished off our desserts. We did. So this is a, this is a, this is a practical question. It was my Pe first dessert of the week. Uh -huh. Pe people... <laughs> People the, love the first sweets. of how many? <laughs> <laughs> People That's love a, sweets, and yes, we love do. we are hardwired to, to love yes. sweets. This is an inborn taste right. because that taste guided us to instant energy in times when sugar was scarce. So how do we deal with that? That we crave sweet things, we like sweet things, sweet things are our rewards, they make us happy, they give us pleasure. How do we take this information that you're producing, how do we, what do we do in the policy area with this? What do we do in our own lives with it? Well, first, I guess, in our own lives. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, we love refined carbohydrates, and we've worked very hard for, it's more than 50 years, really, since the, the 19th century to kind of mainline sugar, uh, whether it was you know making flour as white as we possibly could, uh, refining sugars from cane and, and beets, and we put a lot of energy into this because we like the, the hit. It's, I mean, it, it's much like a drug. And, um, Not much like a drug. All right, it, it is. is like a drug. <laughs> and um, you know, it's, this, it's this area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, it's the reward system. And you know, cocaine works there, amphetamine works there, nicotine works there, cannabis works there, ethanol works there, and guess what? Sugar works there too, and does the same thing. All right, so it's a drug. <laughs> so the issue is, we have to, t you know, we either have to turn back the trajectory of refinement, in other words, take our sugar in the form it was available to us in nature, fruit, 
um, and sweet vegetables and you know the, the, the forms of I mean sugar like you were saying sugar was very rare and rare honey and we're, that's right, honey. And honey, you took great risks right. to obtain. Exactly. And yes. so there was, you know, exactly. you worked hard. That's right. And um, so that's one thing. And, and, and obviously avoid white flour, too, on the same principle, that when it's less refined, there's, there is fiber to slow absorption and other advantages to, to eating it. So that's one track, is to unrefine our refined food to the extent that we can and don't juice our fruit. And then the other is, I think, figuring out where, how to weave special occasion foods or celebration foods into our lives. Um, I don't know that you're arguing for the elimination of sugar from no, the American diet. No, certainly not. Um, no, I think that basically dessert should be once a week, like I grew up, like you grew up, not once a meal. Like I mean, it is after now. you clean your room, you get dessert? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, question, the question is, what constitutes an appropriate reward? Right in terms of food. Maybe and should food even be, be a reward? reward yeah. Maybe one thing to concentrate on are sweetened drinks. You know, because this seems to be something that's really superfluous that could be eliminated. You know, I grew up drinking soda. Um, I, n I never drink soda anymore. I drink water. I drink, I grew up putting sugar in iced tea. I never do that anymore. I mean, it's possible to unlearn those habits. And uh, it, maybe that would be a good one to concentrate on. Well, one rule that I, that I think is very helpful, and this applies for salt as well as sugar, is that when you let corporations settle on the amount of sugar in your drink or whatever it is, they, they really overdo it. Um, and that if you sweeten your own drinks, you would never put in eight tablespoons or teaspoons or whatever is in a soda. Um, you know, that woman who was asking us about chocolate milk, um, you know, the way, uh, the way a, a milk company sweetens milk is very different than the way you would do it yourself if you had your, your Bosco. So the question is, why do they do that? And the reason they do that is because they know when they'll they do it, sell you'll more buy product. more. That's right. 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 I mean, That's right. We are hardwired to do that. And, and there's and an arms race. And, and whoever sweetens their product more will probably sell more. And Michael, tell your experience of fighting high fructose corn syrup with industry. Well, and you know, this is, I mean, I think that this is a real problem um, of, uh, you know, of, of demonizing any given nutrient. And that's really what we're talking about here, is that, that the industry is very good at taking any critique and turning it into the next marketing campaign. So that, you know, I and, and, um, uh, and, and Andy and others have talked a lot over the last few years about high fructose corn syrup. I don't think the argument was ever that it was worse for you than sugar. In fact, I was very specific whenever I wrote about it, saying it's basically the same as sugar, as far as we know. Um, but everybody focused on it as the one thing to get out of your diet. And so what happens then is you get this, this a burst of new products that are boasting about the fact they've removed the high fructose corn syrup. And so what you've essentially done is created an implicit health claim for sugar. Because as soon as you say no, you know, made with real cane sugar is now a plus. Yeah. And, um, Throwback Pepsi, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm constantly amazed and impressed at their ingenuity in turning whatever kind of medical uh, or political critique you can make about food into a way to sell more of it. Well, the good news is what we used to call the evil <laughs> twins of trans fats and high fructose corn syrup. One of the twins is gone, and now with high fructose corn syrup, but it's really a question of. Um, the economics of it. It's so cheap that it's easy to create the mainline addiction for it. And I'm not sure that's going to change. So Well, the, prob the, the other problem with high fructose corn syrup is it ended up in products that had never been sweetened before. Because it had, I mean, for many reasons. One was it was cheap, but it had certain properties that food scientists loved. It gave a nice brown cast when you were making a hamburger bun. Um, it, uh, it's a mild food preservative if you put it in frozen foods. It, right. it does all these things that, right. that food scientists love. So we ended up um, making sweetness or, or sugar more ubiquitous than it had ever been before. Right. Well, think of it this way. Your tongue has four tastes. There's sweet, <laughs> there's salty, there's sour, there's bitter. Those are the four. The sweet covers up the other three. I mean, salty, think of honey roasted peanuts or Chex Mix. For sour, think of sweet and sour pork. For bitter, think of milk chocolate. I mean, chocolate's bitter, right? Coffee's bitter. You put the sugar in, no, not bitter anymore. <clears throat> Bottom line is, you can make dog poop taste good with enough sugar, and indeed, that's what the food industry's done. <laughs> what, what happened to umami? Yeah, really. 
really? Yeah, I don't know. That, that, I don't know what umami is. I haven't figured out what that taste is yet. <laughs> Interestingly, one of the one of the, the sort of the sugar the, covers that. The too. main <laughs> food talk at this year's TED conference was restaurateurs who were using chemistry to make bitter food taste sweet and food taste different, and it's the latest trend in the culinary arts is to use chemistry that's being used in the industry to change it. So I, I find it sort of fascinating that that's something we, we may have to say, well, do you really leave that behind? And Michael, I go back to a point you made earlier. I, I really want us to get to how do we deal with this sugar issue? Because if everybody leaves here and at least has a few ideas beyond sugary drinks on how to leave the sugar behind, you said don't eat something if you haven't made it yourself. So if you had to bake the cake, perhaps you wouldn't eat it. Well, yeah, another, every day. I mean, another, you know, I, I struggled a lot with coming up with food rules to govern sweets and, and, special, and junk food, essentially. Um, and because I don't think, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to eliminate it from my diet. And I don't think, I mean, there are people who should, but there are many people who shouldn't. Um, you know, I speak about obesity to slender people all the time, and I see it's, it's happening again. Um, I'm not funny reaching the that. right audience. Yeah, funny um, about that. But one rule that I came up with that I found useful is um, eat all the junk food you'd like as long as you prepare it yourself. And a great example, of course, and this isn't about sugar, but is, is French fries. Um, I love French fries. Um, and once upon a time, they were very rare in the American diet, sort of like refined sugar. They're really a pain to make. Um, and the labor that goes into it, and the mess that goes into it, and what do you do with the oil when you're done, um, makes it something that if you were cooking it yourself, you'd really only have it once a month, um, which is probably about right. And the same goes for you know a Twinkie uh, or any number of, of <laughs> foods that I don't know how to make a Twinkie. That's that's pretty. That's too advanced for me. It's a whole book on it. Yeah, yeah there is. That's right. <laughs> Twinkie deconstructed uh, or donuts or all these you know wonderful things. Um, but if you real if you limited your consumption to the ones you actually prepared yourself, I think you'd find a nice equilibrium. A big part of our problem with food is that um, we have outsource the work of making it. And, the, and so part of the reason that special occasion foods were only eaten on special occasions wasn't just health. One was they were expensive. And the reason they were expensive is because it took a lot of work. Um, and once we got so good at processing food, at you know, figuring out ways to throw um, uh, Idaho potatoes at a wall of blades and turn them instantly, if you've ever seen footage of how it's done, it's, it's amazing, uh, and turn them into french fries. Um, it sounds and make like fun fats. if you're throwing the potatoes. Well, they're actually hurled by jets. <laughs> <No>. And um, <laughs> uh, so now the, 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 you know, the, the work that goes into it has been, is, no one has to do that work anymore. And that's one of the reasons we over Let me say something also about the wisdom of eating things as nature produces them. Uh, how many of you ever chewed on a stalk of fresh sugar cane? Some of you have. Okay, so in countries where sugar is grown, uh, it's not uncommon to have people hack lengths of the stalk off. And you can just eat it. You can chew on it. Now, that's got a lot of fiber. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a lot of work to get some sweet juice out of it. Um, in India, where sugar cane is native, uh, I have seen uh, vendors on the street who have hand-cranked presses. And they'll run stalks of sugar cane through the presses and press you a fresh squeezed glass of sugar cane juice, uh, which is sort of a gray-green liquid, watery liquid. They'll squeeze lime in it often. And it's a pleasant, refreshing drink. However, it's got a, it's, you get a, an ambivalent taste from it. You get this sweet, rewarding sweet taste. And then there's a back taste, which isn't so pleasant. Um, and, and as a result, you don't want to drink you know, very, a whole lot of that. One glass is great. If you boil that down to concentrate the sweetness, you also concentrate the unpleasant taste. Uh, and so pure cane juice boiled down, you get that that hit of the other thing, which becomes concentrated in molasses when you take out the, when you separate out the sucrose. And it seems to me that the trouble begins, you know, the farther we move away from that process of either chewing on the sugar cane or pressing the juice, and especially when we begin trying to separate the unpleasant taste from the pleasant taste. And then we wind up with a white crystalline substance, which is purely reinforcing 
it has nothing to limit your intake of it and can be added in, in incredible quantities to other foods. So it seems to me that, the, that this is one, if we could make people aware of that, and as the f whenever you move away from foods as nature produces them, it seems to me you get into trouble. You and the same goes for drugs, too, yeah, as you've written, right? Course, White powder course, drugs right. versus uh, right. chewing on coca leaves yeah, are very exactly. different experiences. So, so I have a, Andy, I have a question. Uh, maybe last year at the public forum, we talked a lot about glycemic index and glycemic load. And for both of you, and Rob, it would be interesting to understand your perspective on it.